don't you think it's amazing at how far technology has advanced relative to only a few decades ago? Look at this old computer from who knows when, maybe 20, 30 years ago. Look at the more recent models. More features, more powerful, but slimmer and smaller each time. Computers are not even computers anymore. Now they're tablets and they're wristwatches. Now, although the tangible nature of the hardware would give the impression that it's more important than the software, it's actually the software that tells the hardware how to behave and how to process information. So that's why the world of computings and machines is characterized by advances in parallel between hardware and software. Okay, so what about humans? When was our last upgrade? Well, unfortunately, in terms of hardware, there hasn't been an upgrade since the appearance of the Homo sapiens species around 200,000 years ago. So in terms of hardware design, we're kind of stuck with this current model. So to further advance as a human species, that means all we can do is work on our software, on our operating system, OS Homo sapiens. So what is this operating system I hear you saying? Well, it's our worldview, which is the way we look at and interpret the world. It's like a lens that filters the very complex reality around us. It tells us a basic story about the world. It provides us with basic information, assumptions, beliefs. And above all, it influences our behavior. Now, religion also plays a role, but arguably, it's science that has the greatest influence over the type of information that goes into our shared operating system. However, the problem is that science, the worldview of science, is based on a very mechanical, material way of viewing reality that emerged during the scientific revolution a few hundred years ago. Now, even though more recent scientific advances have shown many of these assumptions that uphold this worldview to be mistaken, science and our operating system by extension still adheres to this very outdated and incomplete view of reality. So I'm here today to argue that all of us, that we need to upgrade our operating systems. And this new version of software, it has to be able to provide a more comprehensive way of looking at the Earth and ourselves. It has to be able to explain material and non-material phenomena. And it has to be able to bring about the behavioral changes that we need to build a global, peaceful, sustainable civilization. Let's go through some changes together. Now, in the current version of our operating system, this is how we are told to look at the world. Look at all these colors and these arbitrary political boundaries that divide human society. There's no place for a citizen of the Earth in this picture. This encourages us, us to pay more attention to our differences rather than our similarities. It leads to competition among countries. In some cases, it leads to exploitation or even war. I ask you, is there another way that we can be looking at this world? What our operating system does not tell us is that from space, there are very few political boundaries that are visible. That's why astronauts who return home from the International Space Station report that their view of the Earth and of humanity has radically changed as a result of seeing the Earth from above. The author Frank White, he calls this shift in perception the overview effect. Now, in the overview effect, astronauts report, report firstly a feeling of awe for the immense beauty of planet Earth. But beyond this, there's a feeling of affinity, a feeling of interconnection with all humans and with all life forms. And then this then leads to a sense of responsibility for having to take care of the environment for the entire planet. So this is a very comprehensive way of viewing the Earth and ourselves that surely, I think, should be programmed into our operating systems upgrade. But is the Earth alive? Now, this is a fundamental question that determines our attitude towards and our treatment of the Earth. Our current operating system tells us that the Earth is dead. Now, yes, there is life on Earth, but nature as a whole, as an integrated whole, is not considered to be a living entity. So just how accurate is this story? How strange really is the idea that nature is alive? For the majority of human history, we've considered nature to be alive. The Shinto religion in, in Japan considers nature to be animate and full of individual gods. Countless indigenous peoples across the world consider not only nature, but Earth and the entire universe to be alive. And Europeans too, up until a few hundred years ago, we also considered nature to be alive. 
Stuff that today we regard as dead matter, rocks, trees, sticks, water, etc., was regarded as alive and sacred. Now, that's why some forests were regarded as having magical powers of being enchanted. And this wondrous view of nature, this heavily influenced our behavior. It prevented us, for example, from going down and cutting down a huge area of forest for our short-term material gain. But our current operating system does not view nature in this way. It has inherited a, a material, a mechanical way of viewing the world that was first inherited by great scientists such as Isaac Newton, shown here. He saw the world as a giant soulless machine, functioning like the cogs and wheels in a gigantic clock. So, inheriting this worldview, nature which, once, which, nature which once upon a time had a soul has now been stripped down to a purely physical phenomenon of which the basic components are simply atoms, molecules and energy. So, our current operating system tells us that nature, such as forests and large areas of the Earth, are just a chunk of matter that's basically dead. And this provides us with the intellectual justification to go out and exploit that matter for our material gain. So, of course, we've made spectacular material progress since the scientific revolution, but we've sacrificed nature for this. Climate change, the loss of animal species across the planet, the exhaustion of natural resources, the accumulation of plastics in the ocean. All of these are just symptoms of an unhealthy human-nature relationship, and behind this is an unhealthy way of viewing nature. Maybe if our operating system told us that nature was alive, then perhaps we might treat it differently. As it turns out, science is starting to provide a, radically new vision, a radical new vision of nature. Forests, it seems, are not just a collection of stupid, soulless, individual trees. They are communities teeming with life and intelligence. And furthermore, they are an arena of cooperation. Now, trees actually cooperate with each other. They share carbon with each other. This, this is carbon that's been absorbed from the atmosphere that's then shared with other trees through root systems with cooperation of fungi in the soil. Now, the scientist Suzanne Simard you can check out her really great uh, presentation, by the way, a TED presentation, by the way. She's conducted groundbreaking research in the forest in uh, British Columbia, Canada, shown here. Through an analysis of a network analysis of carbon flows, her team discovered that the larger fir trees, what she calls the mother trees, are actively sending their carbon to their kin, to the babies, to the seedlings on the forest floor. And this then increases the survival rate of these seedlings by around fourfold. So we have fascinating scientific evidence here, here that suggests that nature is far more inter interconnected, intelligent, and for lack of a better word, alive than our current operating system tells us. Let's consider another problem in our OS Homo sapiens. Our current version tells us that the mind and the body are, com and the body are completely separate. Now, this is an idea that emerged in science from the very influential ideas of René Descartes, shown here. So, inheriting this worldview, science views the human organism basically as a machine, and it has organized its study into two separate disciplines. We have medicine, which is the study of the body, and we have psychology, which is the study of the mind. Now, doctors in either field, they generally specialize in their area alone they don't really pay much attention to the interlinkages between the body and the mind. Now, science is starting to understand the problems with this dualistic view of the mind and body. We know now that mental stress can manifest as physical distress. We know that this can result in, for example, high blood pressure and digestive problems. And conversely, we know that calming the mind can sometimes address these problems, for example, through meditation. However, our understanding of the mind and body link is still incomplete. The placebo effect is the ultimate example of this. Now, one of the most fascinating study th studies out there on the placebo effect is this study that was done in the United States, and this is an experiment that involved about 165 people who had knee arthritis. Now, patients were divided into three groups. Two of them received an authentic operation. The knee joint was operated on, and either the knee cartilage was shaved or fluid was flushed into the knee joint. But the third group, this was the placebo group, 
they received a completely fake operation. But they were taken into the operating theater. The knee joint was cut open, but the doctors just pretended to operate. And the patients were only told two years later if their operation was real or not. Can you imagine that? Now, for this entire two period, the placebo group, who had received a completely fake operation, healed to the same extent and even slightly better than the other two groups who received a real operation. So we have startling evidence here that proves beyond a doubt that firstly, the mind and the body is tightly interconnected, and secondly, that the mind plays a crucial role in the physical healing process. In some cases, more than surgery and drugs. So, this knowledge is incomplete, more research is required, but surely this new integral vision of the human mind and body should go into our upgrade for our operating system. So science can enrich our operating system. It can provide us with fascinating new insights into the very complex, interconnected and intelligent world around us. But science today cannot provide all the answers that we need. And the reason for that is because of the materialistic way that science views reality. It views it as a giant soulless machine where minds and matter are separate. This is unable to explain many non-material phenomena in the human existence. Let's consider, for example, some really, really important questions for Homo sapiens. Do you think that you have a soul? Many of us do. Many religions tell us that we do. Well, what happens to your soul when you die? Does it go to heaven, like in the Christian conception of human existence, or is it recycled? Is it reborn, like in the Buddhist or in the Hindu idea of reincarnation? Unfortunately, science cannot answer this question because science has made institutional norms where research is confined to physical phenomena in the physical world. This is generally speaking. Put simply, the soul does not exist in science. Now, fortunately, some scientists, although very few in number, are starting to tackle these big questions. And their studies are showing that our current understanding of the human mind and the body is perhaps completely mistaken. Here's a study that appeared in the prestigious medical journal, The Lancet. This involved a study of the after-death experiences of approximately 340 patients that had died of a cardiac arrest that were brought into hospitals across Holland, but they were later brought back to life by uh, medical teams. Now, interviews with these patients revealed that around one-fifth had experienced a so-called near-death experience. Now, of this subgroup, approximately half claimed that they were aware of being dead. And around one-third claimed that after dying, they had passed through some sort of tunnel, or they had met their, uh, their um, deceased acquaintances on the other side, or that they had seen some sort of heavenly landscape. Now, all of this has happened after they have been diagnosed as clinically dead. Their brain is non-functioning. Their brain is starved of blood and oxygen. How can this be? One man claimed that he was aware of how his dead body was being treated. He experienced a nurse pulling out his, his false teeth and putting them away. So he surprised that nurse when he was resuscitated and about one week later when he saw her, he asked for his false teeth back and he told her where she had put the false teeth. So along with other studies, these studies are suggesting that the brain, which in these patients' case was non-functional, is not perhaps responsible for our consciousness. Now, this is providing indication that perhaps there is a human soul, that perhaps there is an afterlife. Much more research is required. This is incomplete knowledge, but surely this integral view of the human existence of the mind and body should go into the upgrade of our operating system. So we as a community, as a local and as a global community, we have to start a conversation about the type of shared intelligence the type of operating system we need to guide our species into the future. The story about the world told to us by our current operating system is incomplete and out of date. It is unable to offer explanations for many non-material phenomena in the human existence. It does nothing to promote spiritual development, and it is often unable to explain the very intricate, sophisticated, and intelligent workings of nature. So we have to update our operating system not just once, but again and again, as new challenges arise and as new knowledge into the world around us emerges. So my question to you all is, what will your new operating system be? 
And how will it make the world look to you? This is a challenge for all homo sapiens. Thank you.